May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I have a confession to make. Um, this week, I could not stay out of a Facebook comment thread. <laughs> it happens to the best of us. And so there was this, y'all have been part of these neighborhood Facebook groups. Not next door. Next door is, that's beyond the pale. I've left all of those. But this is, you know, and like, I pastor a church that's in South Lake and Keller, and so I'm part of the, I don't even live here and I deal with these people's problems, right? I live down in North Richland Hills, and so I've got my own set of problems down there. So I found myself in a Birdville Families Facebook group, which I'm in this group because it talks about school district things and whatever, and I try to be a good citizen. So I'm there. And there's this whole, I'm, see, I'm going to get myself riled up. Uh, just breathe. So there was this, there was this um, conversation because the, the, um, the, the three bands, right, Haltom, Birdville, and Richland, where my boys go, those three bands, they were invited in a couple years to go to the Rose Bowl Parade. Great. They, last year, this is a multi-year thing, last year they surveyed all the parents. We're like, yeah, we'll pay for it. We'll help people who can't afford to go. Like, we got it, right? The school board is like, no, we're not going to be able to afford it. We're not going to do it. You know, we have to be stewards of the money we're given. So it's, oh, my goodness. This comment thread, let me tell you people. <laughs> it's fine. I'm used to seeing people go crazy about school board stuff. But then somebody chimed up and basically said, people in the band can't do what the athletes do. Oh. See? Look here. Oh, my gosh. Right? I'm an athlete. I, I can't play an instrument. So, like, those people can do things I can't do. Anyway, my kid who's in... Right? And so I, I popped up and I commented on this thing, right? <clears throat> I protected the name of the innocent. So I have this. Then I've got paragraphs, right? Like, I don't just, like, you see I cut off the top part. I'm saving you. Man, it goes on and on, right? I start off, it's, this is uninformed or ignorant, right? And then I lay it out there. Oh, you know how these things go. And so this guy, whose name will continue, he decided to call me a Greek philosopher. <laughs> I, think he probably, I think he probably meant hypocrite. <laughs> but point taken. I did call him ignorant. I tried to be careful, but I went to war with the weapon that I have. You people, I, I speak and I write for a living. I make arguments for a living. I can do this all day. Before you all allowed me to stand up here and like do this, I used to ghostwrite for lawyers, right? Like, I'm good at this. I can win this. <laughs> Give me a keyboard and that's my weapon of war. But what good is that? It does no good. No, well-reasoned arguments never win Facebook discussion groups. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you there, right there. So I must confess to you this today because I was convicted when I read our second reading from Ephesians where Paul tells us, pick up your weapons of war. And I'm like, yeah, Paul, I did it. I got on that keyboard. I'm ready to go. And Paul's like, you're missing the point. So we have this reading in Ephesians, right? You can take down the thing that calls me a hypocrite, please, Chuck. You can, you can take that out there. They don't need any more reminder uh, than that. And just to, to close that circle, I reply. I was like, yeah, I am. I'm sorry. He and I had some messages. I'm like, any pastor that tells you they're not Hippocrates, they're lying to you. <laughs> <clears throat> No, I didn't go there. It, it, it took everything. But I was like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. I'm human. Let's just leave it at that. Then I made a donation in his name to the marching band. So we'll just leave that aside. And y'all can see that I'm utterly, utterly human. We've been working our way through 
Ephesians, right? And we have these beautiful passages. We've heard the first week I came up here and I reminded you what Paul's reminding us in this letter. You're beloved, you're called, you're chosen, you're blessed, you're all of these things, right? And then Gavin and I spent the last couple weeks saying, Paul is reminding us God has broken down every dividing wall, right? I reminded you of this. Then we've gone on and, and Paul turns and it gets a little uncomfortable and he says, okay, here's how you need to live. Last week, my friend Chris here told us, tell the truth, even when it hurts, be transparent. Right? Paul tells us how to live. We skipped a part in the lectionary. This past week, Gavin and I did a YouTube video on it where Paul tells us, um, it's a little complicated, you need to go watch the, the video because in, in the scripture, Paul says, wives, be subject to your husbands. That's what he says. He says, children, be subject to your parents. He says, slaves, be subject to your master. That, that sounds really hard to hear. Maybe there's a reason we skip that reading on Sundays and we, and we jump to this bit. But Paul's telling us there's a way we need to live. And so the first five chapters and a little bit of the sixth chapter, Paul goes to great lengths to say, y'all are chosen, you're called, you're one, act like it. And that's what we've been doing here for these last several weeks. And then Paul brings it home today and says, all of this that I've been telling you, I've been reminding you that you're called, I've been reminding you that you're chosen, I've been reminding you that you're one, because we are ready for war. And that's where he picks up today. He says, armor up. Put on the whole armor of God. So I wonder how those folks would have heard that. Those original hearers, of this letter, they lived in occupied land where they saw people in armor marching down the street. They're used to what armor looks like. They've seen the wood, they've seen the leather, they've seen the steel of that armor. Paul himself is writing this letter while he is chained to a soldier. It's like the soldier goes anywhere, Paul's like drug along behind him, so he knows firsthand. He's writing this letter, and he's probably telling you guys, gear up. And so how do these folks hear that? If they're like me, they maybe hear it as, okay, this is a locker room thing. We're getting riled up, and this is like the scene from 300, the movie, or Gladiator, and we're about to go tear down a wall. Because we hear that. He tells us the armor we need. We need our belt. We need our breastplate. We need our shoes. We need our helmet. We need our shield. We need our sword. Okay, we've got it. Let's go to war. But where's the leather? Where's the wood? Where's the steel? The armor of the world is made of these things. The belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the helmet, the shield, the sword. They're made of leather and wood and steel for a certain type of war. But what does Paul tell us to put on? Truth. Righteousness. Salvation, prayer, anything that prepares you to share the gospel of peace. This armor doesn't look like the world's armor. Because our battle doesn't look like what the world tells us the battle's about. Paul says in his letter, our battle is not against flesh and blood. Too often, we see our battles as against flesh and blood. My battle this week was against a person, to my shame. Our battles, in this, whether in the, they're in the church and its personality conflicts, whether it's in the world and its ideologies, whether, wherever it is, that battle, we, we only see it this way. We see it as us versus them. We see it as good versus evil. And so we dehumanize. 
No matter if you're in here, no matter which way you vote, there's a Christian leader out there who this past week told you you're not a real Christian. Because I've seen those Facebook posts that said Republicans can't be Christians. I've seen them that said Democrats can't be Christians because we dehumanize. And we think this battle is us against them and person against person and that it's human. We can only see a battle against flesh and blood. But Paul tells us that's not the real war going on. Because that way of seeing the world, a battle of flesh and blood, we see that because we don't know how big God's love really is. Because when we see the battle that way, what we're saying is God's not big enough to love you and me both at the same time. God's not strong enough to save you and me both at the same time. And in this war, we don't need leather, we don't need wood, we don't need steel. In this war, we need truth and righteousness and salvation and spirit and prayer. And we need peace. But too often we go for that other kind. Our church has these, not our church specifically, the church, has these calendars where we look at people of the faith who have done great things. And we have days that recognize them. Our book is called Lesser Feast and Fast. If you want to check it out, you can Google it. And almost every day of the year, you can find a story of a hero of the faith. Some are saints, and we call them saints like Martin. Some are people who've just, just done great things. And this coming week, we're on the August 30th, we're going to recognize three women. Margaret, Mary, and, oh, I thought I was going to remember the last name. Anne. Someone was paying attention at 8.30. Margaret and Mary and Anne. These are three Catholic ladies from the 16th and 17th century in England. And if you remember your history, either British history or religious history, it was a little bit hard to be Catholic in England in the 16th and 17th century because that's when we, the Anglican church, right? That's our heritage. We were figuring out, are we going to be Protestant? Are we going to be Catholic? It basically depends on who's king or queen at the time. Y'all remember all this from your history class, right? Sorry, it's back to school. We're doing all of this, right? These three women were Catholics. They, they did nothing other than trying to help their priests, trying to serve their church, trying to practice their faith. They did it all over a course of decades. It wasn't all at once. But these three women stand in as a symbol because all they did was try to live out their faith. And we, the Church of England, the Anglicans, killed them for it. Because we couldn't believe that God loved them at the same time. And so to our credit, we recognize these women, we recognize the 40 martyrs of England, we recognize these people that we killed during one of the worst moments of our tradition. We recognize these people who suffered because we could only see the armor of the world. And so we took the leather, and we took the wood, and we took the steel, and we killed with it. But last week, we remembered someone else. A young man by the name of Jonathan Daniels. Maybe you know this story. He, in the 1960s, was a seminarian, an Episcopal seminarian in the Northeast. And he went down to Selma, Alabama to join the marches because his, his faith compelled him to. And he was down there <clears throat> and spent time down there, and he was so moved that after he went back to continue his studies, right, he couldn't stay in school. And so he took a leave and went back down, and on August 14th, he was arrested. He was arrested with a bunch of folks who were marching for justice, who were calling for peace, who were fighting for civil rights. There were so many of them arrested that day, they had to put them in a dump truck and take them to the jail. 
And they got put in jail on the 14th. They made a pact amongst themselves. All the people arrested said, none of us are getting out of here until all of us are getting out of here. It took them six days for all of them to get released. And so on August 20th, they get released. Jonathan and some of um, the folks working with him and a young woman named Ruby Sales tried to go to a convenience store to get something to drink. And someone walked up to this group. Ruby Sales is a young African-American woman. She's still alive. A man approached them with a shotgun. Jonathan pushed Ruby aside, stood where she was, and was shot to death. The man who shot Jonathan Daniels was a Christian who couldn't believe that God could love him and her at the same time. The person who shot Jonathan Daniels picked up the armor of the world, the wood, the leather, and the steel. Jonathan picked up the armor of God, the truth the righteousness, the peace. And it cost him his life. Because the armor of God, it's not going to protect us from harm. The armor of God might actually put us in harm's way. The armor of God is not concerned with our personal safety. The armor of God isn't concerned with death because it knows that death doesn't have the final word. The armor of God is concerned with life, a life lived to its fullest, a life lived in truth, a life lived in righteousness, a life lived in peace. And so we get to choose every day what armor are we going to put on? Are we going to grab wood and leather and steel? Are we going to grab a keyboard? Or are we going to reach for the armor of God? An armor that strengthens us. An armor that encourages us. An armor that compels us. to live a life of truth, a life of righteousness, a life of prayer, and a life of peace. Amen.